I think we are, I think we're live. Panel, are we, are we ready? Okay, I just got a note saying begin. So, so we are live. So, so good morning, everyone. And, and uh, thank you to everyone out there who has taken the time to, uh, to join what I'm sure will be a really, really informative conversation on the topic of uh, multiple myeloma. Let me, let me first introduce myself and then I'll, I'll do uh, what's more important and that is introduce our, our esteemed uh, panel. Um, but my name is Bill White and I uh, work for uh, Janssen Pharmaceutica, which is a division of Johnson & Johnson. Um, and we are really, really proud to, in combination with Kappa Alpha Psi fraternity, my fraternity, and I have my red tie on, I have my life membership pen on today. We are really, really happy to be partnering with Black Health Matters to talk about uh, a subject this morning that uh, needs to be elevated in the African, African American community and around the country, quite honestly. Uh, you know, Jansen is really proud to be a part of this. You know, Johnson & Johnson has recently committed uh, $100 million over the next five years to do more programming like this and to help uh, close the gap uh, in racial uh, health disparities, which we all know uh, exists in our country. And I'm, I'm so happy that we have this uh, esteemed panel. Uh, the conversation is going to be uh, dynamic. Um, and uh, we hope that all of you out there that are listening uh, will take away something uh, for either yourself or your loved ones or people that you know who may suffer from uh, multiple myeloma. Let me introduce our panel. We've got truly uh, uh, an expert panel uh, here this morning that uh, I'm sure you'll find extremely informative. First of all, uh, I'll introduce Dr. Dr. Brandon Blue, who is a oncologist uh, at the Moffitt Cancer Center. Uh, Dr. Blue uh, has a, uh, a specialty in myeloma as, as does uh, Dr. Horace Smith. Uh, and Dr. Dr. Blue is, uh, is going to uh, help us understand the uh, dynamics, diagnosis uh, of uh, multiple myeloma, uh, as well as uh, a few other things related to uh, the disease. Uh, Bishop uh, Horace Smith uh, from the Apostolic uh, Church in uh, Chicago, Illinois, is a uh, pediatric uh, hematologist um, uh, and uh, works very closely in the community in the Chicago area land uh, to advocate for uh, the closure of uh, racial uh, disparities in health. So we welcome uh, both uh, Dr. Blue and, uh, and Dr. Dr. Horace Smith. Um, we also have Dr. Tiffany Williams, um, who is a professor, assistant professor at uh, University, University of South Carolina um, and is a patient. Uh, and is here to provide uh, the patient perspective uh, as it relates to her journey as a multiple myeloma patient uh, and really to accentuate some of the things that you'll hear from a clinical perspective uh, from both Dr. Blue and, uh, and Dr. Smith. So thank you to the panel um, and, um, and let's, let's begin our, our discussion this morning. Uh, Dr. Blue, uh, why don't we start with the basics? What is multiple myeloma? How is it diagnosed? Yeah, so uh, I appreciate everyone for uh, really joining us this morning. One of the main things that we want to talk about today is multiple myeloma. And some of you may have never heard of that. So you say, well, what is it? All right. So if you think about it, let's just say you are 50 years old. OK, the blood that you have running around in your body right now is not the same blood that you had when you were born with. Your body constantly makes new blood cells. And where do they do that? Inside of the bone marrow, okay? So it makes all these different cells called white blood cells, red blood cells, and those kind of things. One of the things that it makes also is called antibodies, all right? And the cells that actually make these antibodies are called plasma cells. 
Unfortunately, for most people, these plasma cells, they do what antibodies like to do. They get rid of bacteria, uh, viruses, you know, things that are part of our immune system. But unfortunately, for a certain group of people, these plasma cells, which are typically normal, unfortunately turn rogue and they basically start growing without the body telling them to do so. And when we have a buildup of these extra plasma cells, unfortunately, it turns cancerous. And that's where we have multiple myeloma. So in order to really know for sure what's happening, we typically have to do what they call a bone marrow biopsy. And then fortunately, we have various different treatments. And uh, while multiple myeloma is not curable, it is something that we can treat very well and typically have people into what we call remission for years and years. Thank you, uh, Dr. Blue. Now, Dr. Blue, did you mention when is, when is generally speaking, uh, multiple myeloma uh, diagnosed is it early in life or uh, mid-stage? Could you add yeah. a little commentary there? Yeah. So, you know, typically it is a, a disease of, of, of aging, right? So typically we see people in their mid to late 60s get diagnosed with multiple myeloma. Unfortunately, for African-Americans, it is younger. Okay. So we see it about 10 years younger. So now instead of mid to late 60s, now we're looking at people in their 50s. And, um, you know, as we know that a lot of times, uh, unfortunately in America, a lot of times with healthcare and a lot of those things are associated with people's employment. And so sometimes if you're in your 50s, you might not even really have access to things like Medicare and those kind of things, which typically a lot of patients do have access to. And that's a whole nother discussion. Um, but yeah, but that's typically um, what we see, unfortunately, in the African-American community. Yeah, is, is, um, is, there, is there any reason why, Dr. Blue, we see this earlier diagnosis in African-Americans? You know, that's a great question also. So that's one thing that we're researching right now. Uh, one thing that we do know is that um, the African-American community typically has a lot more uh, diversity in our genes, if that makes sense, you know? So for example, there's certain communities of people, they can probably trace their like granddaddy, great granddaddy, like all the way back to someplace in Europe, you know what I mean? But unfortunately, because of some of the, the slavery issues and some of the plight of our people, so unfortunately, we had a lot of uh, intermingling, right? So you had people or tribes or groups of people who would never really interact with each other on the continent of Africa. Now they're mixing with each other and having kids. And those, and that's us. We are their offspring. Unfortunately, we also had a lot of things that happened with, between slaves and slave masters. You know what I mean? It also made it a little bit difficult, right? Uh, and so the, it just, when we look at really the genetic makeup of African-American people, unfortunately, we do see that there's a big array and a big uh, uh, difference, right? And so sometimes those differences do create changes uh, that we see today. Okay, and just one final question before we go to uh, our patient advocate. Uh, is there uh, a genetic link? Uh, it sounds like there is. Are, are African-Americans uh, predisposed or at greater risk? Uh, obviously we are, but, but is there anything we can do uh, knowing those, those, those circumstances uh, as part of the African-American community? Yeah, so the biggest thing that I tell all of my patients that honestly, once you know you have multiple myeloma or even a precancerous condition that before you even get the multiple myeloma, you need to start telling your family, okay? And what that family member needs to do is say, hey, my cousin just got diagnosed with this cancer called multiple myeloma. I never heard of this. Am I at risk? Are you seeing none of this, any of this stuff in my blood work? you know, and talking about it. Unfortunately, one of the main things that we see is people kind of like use that C word and don't even like to say cancer, right? And then they get it and then they kind of hold on to it, right? And they like, hey, I'm not telling nobody. I'm either embarrassed or I don't want people in my business, right? You know how we do, okay? Um, and so when they do that, unfortunately, it's hurting the other generations because it's already a rare cancer. So if we don't talk about it at the dinner table, at Thanksgiving, at Christmas, with our own family, how is somebody supposed to know, right? Yeah. And unfortunately, uh, one thing about multiple myeloma, which I didn't really get into, but it can affect your kidneys, it can affect your bones. So if you get, if you catch it early, right? Like if you already have your eyes out or some doctor already looking for this, then you could be one of the fortunate ones to catch it before any of these issues start. Okay. All right, wow, okay. So again, awareness is key. We need to talk about this and make sure um, that other people know about it so we can, we can increase uh, the awareness. Tiffany, I'm gonna come to you. Uh, 
I wonder if you can share your journey. How were you diagnosed? What did you think about when you got the diagnosis? Um, how are you doing today? Okay. So I was diagnosed seven and a half years ago um, at the age of 46, Dr. Blue. So I was even younger than that 50 year old um, that you talked about. Mm. I experienced a really severe and sudden onset of back pain one day. I was in my kitchen cleaning and I'd had a history of a herniated disc the year before. So I contacted the neurosurgeon who had done the repair of that herniated disc. And I was able to get an appointment within a couple of days and he ordered an MRI, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, lesions on my spine were noted on that MRI. And so I was referred to an oncologist and that appointment was, so the, uh, the MRI was like on a Friday, that appointment was on that uh, Tuesday. And I was hospitalized at, from that visit because um, for pain management and also for testing to confirm what they thought was multiple myeloma. And so I received the diagnosis pretty much, I think it was the day of discharge from the hospital later that week. I wasn't familiar with multiple myeloma. My entire career as a nurse was in pediatrics and I was clueless. But in hindsight, I did experience significant fatigue. Mm -hmm. um, probably the word fatigue really didn't even do it justice. Rolling out of the bed, literally, you know, just making myself get out of bed mid morning, um, make it to work, put in a couple of hours, get come home and I'm back in bed. I mean, it, it was fatigue on steroids. And um, also I had history of low white blood count and anemia, mm -hmm. but they were all looked at in isolation of the other. Mm -hmm. The low white blood count and the anemia was always excused as being normal because I was a black woman. And then I attributed the fatigue to just the demands of life, my career, being busy and active in church and in the community, being a super mom to adolescents. Um, but in hindsight, as I look back on it, those really were all early clues. Um, but from the time of diet, from the time of the onset of that back pain to diagnosis was less than two weeks. And we know though, that is not the norm in the typical pathway for most people who are diagnosed with multiple myeloma. So that in and of itself was, um, was really a blessing. And it was that early diagnosis that Dr. Blue talked about. Thank you. Thank you, Tiffany. Um, you know, I wanna bring Dr. Smith into this conversation because Dr. Smith, um, I think you bring an interesting perspective as not only a physician, but a, a, a man of faith. Um, and I wonder if you could just share, you know, how you approach a newly diagnosed patient like Tiffany um, from both of those perspectives, both your, your clinical perspective and perhaps uh, your faith perspective. Yeah, yes, and I'm glad to uh, contribute. I really enjoyed uh, Tiffany's uh, sharing and, and Dr. Blue as well to set it up. So, so again, um, my expertise really is in the community. And I look at uh, disease uh, among all persons, but black folk in, in specifics. And how does our culture, how does our background, how does our mindset uh, as a people affect not only multiple myeloma, but whether it's as Dr. Blue talked about cancer or any condition like that. Um, the key here really is gonna become how do we have access to healthcare as a people? And what do we do when we have either symptoms or so forth? So again, underlying, Tiffany talked about this, that most patients with muscle myeloma, they're not diagnosed with, with uh, back pain. They start early on with these common symptoms, uh, low white count, uh, anemia, fatigue. And if you don't go to a doctor on a regular basis, you kind of blow that off. You know, this is part of my life, I'm very, I'm very busy. And one of my unfortunately best friends a couple of years ago died of multiple myeloma, but it was caught later on and she was a physician, but had been tired for years and, and going through things. So as Dr. Blue pointed out, it's a slowly evolving diagnosis most of the time. You, you don't always have acute symptoms. So the, the key there for me is, and takeaway for our audience is this, regular checkups uh, with competent people is critically important. And the basic things, Dr. Blue said, this is a, a blood, a based kind of abnormality. So, you know, if you are a 
patient under good care, I know what your white count is. I know what your, your red count is. I know what your, your platelet count is. These kinds of things, general symptoms. So good health care from the beginning, it's critically important. And when you look at, again, what really in African-American society, very few of us, well, I shouldn't say that, but not enough of us have regularly good health care. So I think picking it up early is important. And also you'll find out that all of these discrepancies, many of them have a social economic basis. And so as we talk about it later on, I think we'll have to deal with the fact that the clinical issue is critically important, but the real issues in our society go way back to what we talked about earlier, our cultural background, our perspective to health itself, um, preventative disease, very important because we wait often as a people to have symptoms, which is usually a late stage diagnosis. Most diseases, you don't wanna to wait to have a symptom. You wanna have regular care to pick it up as early as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Smith. You said a couple of things that, that, that I wanna just drill into for just a second. You said good care, you said competent care. Yeah. Are there are there warning signs that patients should pay attention to that might advise them to escalate their care if they if they're in the care of a for example a general practitioner are there things that might come out in laboratory results that might suggest you know what I, I, I'm not feeling well. Um, you know, maybe I need to escalate my care. Um, Dr. Blue, I see you wanted to get in. Yeah, you know, this is this. I think this was a great segue. I actually have some perfect slides on this that actually let's talks true. Uh, really, the people and how we present, and really, um, so so let's if we can talk through some of these slides. I think it will really help educate the people because again, this is something that's not common, right? You've heard of breast cancer, you've heard of lung cancer, but like multiple myeloma, what is that, right? So uh, as Dr. Smith mentioned, he talked about white blood cells. As we know, the white blood cells are really the things that are our immune system cells that helps us fight off infections. The red blood cells are those things that carry oxygen. So for example, like if you needed to go run up a flight of stairs, those red blood cells go to your thighs and say, all right, let's get to work. Okay. If you um, see this word platelets on the screen that Dr. Smith mentioned, you say, well, what the heck is platelets? If you ever like been uh, cutting something, you kind of accidentally cut yourself, you know how you hold pressure for a little bit, you're like, oh, it's magic, I stopped bleeding. Playlists are that kind of glue that kind of helps stop you from bleeding, okay? And so that's really one of the main things that helps us. Uh, as we talked about, these things are in our bone marrow, okay? So the white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets that you have at age 50 is different than you had at age 30, age 20, because your bone marrow is kind of making new ones. We'll go to the next slide. And so as part of our immune system, um, um, what happens is that all of our long bones you see in this picture here have this marrow, okay? So all the long bones that you see like on the inside have this bone marrow. And unfortunately, when they turn cancerous and develop those uh, plasma cells, as we talked about, which make those antibodies, then unfortunately, that's where the problem comes. So if you think about it, if these plasma cells grow too much, and they're inside of a bone, what happens when the baby is inside the womb and they run out of space, right? It has nowhere to go. So unfortunately, these plasma cells break those bones, okay? And so th that's why I said a lot of times, unfortunately, when the disease gets to a certain point inside of this marrow, it's, it's confined. It's, and so cancer without treatment just grows. And unfortunately, as a result of that, it breaks bones. Next slide. And so um, this is basically just a picture of what we look at. So in order to know for sure what's happening on the inside of your body, right? Because as Tiffany mentioned, you know, you might feel tired. You might have a little back pain, but you might ask your other friend who's 50 and say, hey, girl, you got back pain? She'd be like, yeah, girl, I, I've been had back pain. Or, you know, you might tell one of your boys and say, hey, do you take a nap every once in a while? They're like, yeah, man, I have to take a... So, you know, and, and honestly, our brains are wired to think that it's normal, that we're fine, right? And nobody, especially, like I said, Black people are younger when they get this, right? So, you know, you might just say, and you know, and you know, for us, we attribute old age, but we'd be like 40. And you'd be like, oh, it's old age, but really, like, that's not really old, right? Um, and so, 
you really try to make sure that you normalize stuff. So in order for us to know as doctors what's happening, we have to do what they call a bone marrow biopsy. And unfortunately, what we look at is we see some of these cancer cells, like what you see here. And honestly, it's very obvious. So if you see the normal cells kind of on the left, and then those cancerous cells, we see that, wow, this really is a big problem. And unfortunately, we see it all too common. Next slide. So um, this is super important, okay? Because this is kind of what we were talking to before. Multiple myeloma is the active cancer, meaning that like, hey, I have this problem and I need treatment. But there's other things that can be done prior to getting this active multiple myeloma, okay? So we call that smoldering myeloma. So typically, most people, almost everybody pretty much before they get multiple myeloma, get this smoldering. But the problem is that there's no symptoms, okay? And so the thing is, is that if the doctor sometimes is paying attention, sometimes we can catch this smoldering before it is active, okay? And the good thing about uh, science and about medicine, I know here at Moffitt Cancer Center and there's other centers across the country, we actually have clinical trials right now to say, hey, if we treat somebody in this inactive cancer state before they even get it, can we cure this? Can we take this active multiple myeloma that's not curable and then actually give them treatment ahead of time and say, hey, let's nip this in the bud. Let's say, hey, can we give them something to make sure that this is something that they never have to worry about again? And that's something where research is heading. And, and that's honestly where I think a lot of the conversation is going is that, hey, this is something that can affect you at multiple different stages. And if it's picked up, certainly at the right time, great things can happen. Next slide. And so, um, so people say, well, how common is this, right? So it's really only about uh, 130,000 people really roughly in America that has multiple myeloma. And, you know, as you know, there's over 300 million people living in America, right? So, you know, we say that roughly it's about eight in 100,000. OK, so it's not very common at all. And that's probably why you never heard of it. Breast cancer, they get the pink shirts, the pink socks. You see them, you know, it's like breast cancer week when you watch the NFL, uh, lung cancer. They get all these different, you know, kind of accolades, prostate. We've heard of it. But most of my loma, unfortunately, because it's really one hundred and thirty thousand people with it in, the, in America, it really doesn't get the light that it should. So I appreciate everyone for uh, giving us this opportunity today because some people never heard of this. And what you don't know sometimes can hurt you. Next slide. So um, uh, so basically, one of the questions that was brought up before is like, what age do people typically you know, get this disease? And as you can see, the amount of cancer that you get with this multiple myeloma goes up with age. So if you compare someone in their uh, 40s, unfortunately, like what Tiffany was referring to, um, you know, the likelihood of that is much lower than if you ramp up to someone who's 70, 80 years old, okay? And unfortunately, the problem is, is that again, I say in African-Americans, we get it at a younger age, typically at about 10 years younger than uh, other race groups, unfortunately. Next slide. And so, all right, what are the signs and symptoms? What are some things that you can look for to kind of say, hey, um, this might be a problem? What your doctor will look at is certain things to say, like, are we having any problems with our kidneys? Because as you know, our kidneys are basically a big filter, okay? All the things that's in your blood that you're supposed to have, your body says, all right, let me keep this. All the things that your body says, these are toxins. These are things that I don't need. It pees it out. You flush it down the toilet, right? You don't need them. But what happens when the body has to work overtime because these cancer cells are there because they're in the blood? Unfortunately, that kidney, it can't keep up. Unfortunately, those cancer cells are in there and unfortunately they cause problems. So that's one of the main things that we look for to say, hey, this is an issue. Also, we look at the bones. As I told you before, these cancer cells are in that bone marrow. So if they're in the bones and they're causing problems, as Tiffany mentioned, she had an MRI and they say, hey, this doesn't look right. You know, something here is causing damage. And that's something that we pay close attention to. If you remember from when you were in elementary school, one thing you learned is that most of the calcium in your body is inside of your bones. So now if you have bone damage, right, that calcium that's supposed to be in the bones, now it's just floating around looking for a home because it doesn't have a place to go. 
okay? And one of the other main things that Tiffany brought up is low blood counts called anemia, all right? The reason why that's important is if the bone marrow is the factory that makes these red blood cells and now the factory has cancer in it, of course the factory is not gonna work as good as it should. So those blood counts are low, okay? And so those are the things that we look for to kind of see, is this a problem? Next slide. And so um, there's tests that people could look in the blood and, and the urine, because I told you that makes sense, right? Because the urine will tell us what's happening there. That bone marrow biopsy, we get a glimpse inside the bone marrow and say, hey, are there cancer cells there or not? There's MRIs, PET scans. There's, there's a lot of different stuff that as doctors we can use to kind of figure out what's happening. And um, it's not even just... Um, uh, the, some of those characteristics that I mentioned, because what we want to do is catch it before that kidney function turns abnormal or catch it before that blood count goes low and you get that anemia, you know? And so that's why it takes someone very astute to figure out what's happening. Next slide. And so um, just know that uh, as doctors, we basically look at what they call evidence-based, meaning that like there's a lot of research and there's a lot of study that goes on and says very specific numbers. If your kidney function is at this level, this is very concerning to us. This is what needs to happen. If that hemoglobin or that anemia is so severe at a certain level, this is what needs to happen. If that MRI or PET scan shows something in particular, this is what needs to happen. So just know that as the doctors, um, we have very strict criteria to say, hey, this is a problem or this isn't as big of a problem. And it's based off of research and science. Okay, next slide. And so one of the main things that I wanted to talk about um, with some of this, because these are the people that we're talking to, is that us, unfortunately, as Black folks, unfortunately, don't have the same um, uh, experience with this disease as non-Black folks, okay? So for example, before you even get the cancer, okay, there's a pre-cancer. We short-term it MGUS just because doctors don't like to write a lot, but the long name is monoclonal gammopathy of unknown significance. It just sounds kind of funny, but really MGUS is really the name for it. And it's actually before you get the cancer. And what the study shows is that black folks actually have a higher rate of actually getting this pre-cancer, not only getting it, but also getting it at a younger age. And this is through science, this is through data and research shows us this. Next slide. And so as you can see here, right, so these are these people with this pre-cancer, okay, and if you look at really each of these age groups, starting with the gray color, the gray color is the black folks, okay, so African Americans at pretty much each age group have a higher chance of having this pre-cancer, okay, and as we know, as I talked about, unfortunately, pre-cancer turns into cancer, OK, so if they have a higher rate of having the precancer, then what do you think is going to happen? You know, five, 10 years down the road, they unfortunately develop that cancer. And as you see what age it starts in their 20s, you don't see no European uh, ancestry people having this type of precancerous problems in their 20s. OK, and so this is something that really has to bring very much attention to. So hopefully people are out there listening because you can be young, thinking you fly, thinking you're doing all right, doing your kappa shimmy in, and really having some big issues. So I appreciate everybody for doing all the, uh, the things that you're doing, but really listening and paying close attention really could save your life. All right, next slide. Hey, Dr. Blue, yeah. listen, I, I, I can tell you people are listening because the chat's blowing up. All right, wonderful. Questions for you and Dr. Smith here. So. So, so people are asking based on what you're, you're saying, when should I be referred to potentially a hematologist? You know what, Bill, I'm gonna get there. I got a couple more slides and it might hit on that exact topic, okay? Okay. All right. okay. I, I want people to also kind of take this into consideration, all right? So if you look at between males and females, okay? So if you are a white male, you have about 7.8 times to get in out of 100,000 to get in this multi-myeloma disease. But if you're a black male, us who unfortunately don't go to the doctor as much as our sisters, it's 16. 15.9 times out of 100. So that's double. That's twice the amount of chance of a black male getting it. All right. And then if you look at the sisters, for example, look at the white men, white uh, females, they have about four out of 100,000. But you look at the black females, almost 12 out of 100,000. So really, if you put that together, unfortunately, 
the black brothers and black sisters, especially as some of us guys are so hard headed, especially when we're younger like us, like we just nearly not trying to see no doctors. OK, and so it becomes a problem because, as I told you before, catching some of this stuff early really kind of leads to better outcomes down the road. Next slide. And so this is kind of just proves home a certain point, okay? So if you look again at the ages, okay, this kind of a uh, purple line here is African-Americans. So not only are we getting is that line coming at an earlier age, but we're also getting it more often, all right? And hopefully for the reasons why I just explained, because we have more of the pre-cancer, right? Then that means we get more of the cancer, okay? And we get it at a higher rate and an earlier time period. OK, so your doctor might tell you if they don't know the data and they're not up on what's happening, especially for our people. Oh, no, no, no. You too young for that. You that only happens to people in their 60s. Right. This shows you that's not true. OK. And so you just got to have somebody who what they call is cultural competent to know what's happening. Next slide. And so this is one thing that I think is super important. So if you really don't hear nothing else, here it is. OK. Unfortunately, black people sometimes present with this disease differently than other people, right? So if your doctor looking for X, but black people typically present with Y, then they gonna miss it, okay? So if you look at this, so if you look at what we call renal dysfunction, what that really means is that all your kidneys screaming out, some wrong, some wrong. But unfortunately, what some of the doctors do, unfortunately, is they say, oh, that's just diabetes. That's high blood pressure, because honestly, we got other problems besides cancer, right? We got heart disease, we got diabetes, you know, unfortunately as a people, we do have problems, right? So people sometimes don't really do the extra check to say, hey, let me just make sure this is due to diabetes. Let me just make sure this is due to uh, hypertension. And it's a simple urine test that basically can look to see if somebody is actually spilling some of these cancer proteins in their urine. So black people do present with much more kidney dysfunction than other folks, right? Also that anemia, unfortunately, especially as black women, black women have a much higher rate of having what they call uterine fibroids, okay? So that, so a lot of times what doctors might say is, oh, that's just your iron or just, you know, and, but there's also, they never even checked your iron level. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Like, like, like this happens all the time where they kind of just say, hey, black folks, this is a typical problem in your community, blah, blah, blah. But without doing some of these steps to say, hey, actually this might be something more to it. OK, and unfortunately, because multiple myeloma is rare, like, don't get me wrong, not everybody with kidney problems and low blood counts have this issue. But if if they see that, sometimes they can um, really catch things early. OK, okay. Next, be careful with that. next slide. And so this is kind of the, the unfortunate problem that we have. OK, so if you look at this slot, the, the graph in the middle, as I told you before, we have the higher when it were incidence is there. That means we get it the most. OK, so the little triangles are the black folks. OK, and that's us all the way at the top, not even close to the other races. If you really look at it, you know, like we just get it much higher. OK, and then if you look at the, the graph all the way to the right, Unfortunately, that also means we die from it the most. And unfortunately, that's not even close. Mm -hmm. If you look at these other races, Hispanics, you know, Asians, blah, 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 they're very close to the, uh, the white Americans and they basically are all pretty much grouped together, okay? But where you look at, not only are we getting it higher, but unfortunately we are dying from it at a much uh, higher rate than everybody else. So next slide. So then the big thing is they like, well, why? Why we gotta die from this? Like what's happening, right? So the main thing that we have found out is that one of the strongest um, tools that we have to really kind of like combat this disease is called a stem cell or bone marrow transplant. But really, if they, if they looked at it, black people not getting the transplants. So it's like, like Dr. Smith was mentioning earlier, it's like, if you saying that, you know, you got this big fight that you're trying to fight and we saying, hey, we got a big gun that can take care of this or at least help with this, but they only giving you a knife, like we gonna lose that fight, unfortunately, okay? And so what we trying to work on is really trying to say, hey, this stem cell thing is a big game changer. But unfortunately as doctors, like, so for example, for myself, I, I work with people and do this bone marrow. I need to know that you got this disease, meaning your doctor needs to refer you to come see me before I can even give you this potentially life helping procedure. But unfortunately your doctor might say, 
well, this doctor is what they call, I mean, this patient is what they call non-compliant, or he probably couldn't afford something like that. You know, doctors, unfortunately, make some of this, like, what they call a stigma, or they might put you in this little box or this little group and say, you know what, I'm not even going to send them for this procedure because they probably can't afford to, to go, or they probably won't have no help. But, you know, they come up with all these excuses, okay? But as a patient or somebody who kind of, like, is woke, because you're like, hey, I heard at this uh, Kappa meeting that really stem cell transplant is supposed to be what I'm supposed to get. And people are like, oh, he actually know what he's talking about. Let me go actually do the right thing. And unfortunately, that happens too common. Next slide. Because actually, this is what they did. They actually did studies, right? So they took 46 white people, 46 black people, and they say, you know what? Let's give them the same treatment, meaning that like, you know, the same like chemotherapy, the same transplant, the same everything. And, and let's not say is access the issue, right? And actually, as you can see here, for the first time, that survival, meaning that Black folks actually did better when they got the exact same treatment, you know, including that stem cell transplant. So in people who are less than 65, meaning like the younger folks, because again, Black people get at a younger age, we actually did better than white folks for once. OK, and then when they saw even if you were 65 and older, we did the same, meaning that like if you get what you're supposed to get, meaning the right medicines, the right kind of treatment, the right team around you, then we good. But unfortunately, we not getting to this point. And this was only done in 46 people. So as I told you, it's 130,000 people with this problem. But this was only this was a, a study that was only done in 46. So that was just a little information for the people. Hopefully that made sense to people. Hopefully people was able to follow that. And, um, you know, like I said, I'm here to kind of make sure that we change this this narrative. Wow, that that's phenomenal, Dr. Blue. A lot of questions coming in. So let's let's get right to it. Um, uh, well, let me pivot for a minute. You talked a lot about diagnoses, um, the, the disparity in outcomes. What are you most excited about in terms of treatment? And then Tiffany would love to hear your uh, treatment experience. So Dr. Smith, Dr. Blue, quickly, your, your, your thoughts about available treatment today. Yeah, so honestly, the, the, the world is wide open. Um, great companies such as Janssen have really been kind of moving the needle forward and making sure that we have much more treatment. Like 10 years ago, if we were to say, hey, you got multiple myeloma, unfortunately, you would be looking at somewhere between five years or so. Now you got multiple myeloma, we send this is what they call a chronic cancer, meaning that we expect years and years and years worth of having this disease. This not like you get diagnosed with this and they like, hey, you need to call your mama, call your cousin, because you know we need to start making plans. It's like, no, we got it, we can take care of it. And if that treatment doesn't work, boom, here's another and another and another, because we have that many treatments available. One of the main things I'm excited about, I'll just say this and then I'll be quiet, is that back in May, so this is what, July? So literally about two months ago, one of the main things that was a game changer is what they call CAR T cells, okay? Basically using the body's own immune system to help fight cancer cells. But unfortunately, who's getting this latest and greatest? It ain't us. OK, so I'm telling you all today, this is a game changer in this disease. OK, so if you not if you have this disease or your cousin, your, your grandma, somebody have this disease and you feeling like things is moving a little slow, you need to get a second opinion, because I'm telling you, it's some things out there that people may have never heard about if they're not up to date on the latest and greatest. Thank you, Dr. Blue. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to go to Tiffany. I'd love to hear your experience as a patient. And then we're going to come to Dr. Smith. I think Dr. Smith can accentuate what do we need to do in a community to continue to try to raise the awareness and get a groundswell of momentum behind this kind of a disease state? Tiffany, what, uh, what was your experience like as a patient? So first I wanna, I wanna comment though a little, uh, for a minute on um, some of what Dr. Blue talked about. That passion and that fire that, that he has, that's why I do what I do as a patient, as a patient advocate, because it's like that that's the fire that I feel shut up in my bones right now, you know, just hearing him um, um, uh, talk about those disparities. And if you think about it, it's not OK. It is not OK. And that is the message that we have to take to our community. Um, and he also talked a lot about it being rare. And it is until it happens to you or someone you love. And that's how I feel about it. You know, of that 130,000 people, I'm one of those. Why is that? You know, so um, I started uh, my treatment the Monday after I was diagnosed. So once again, I'm on a fast path 
um, from the start of that back pain. Um, I received infusion therapy for about three, uh, three days a week for roughly about seven months. And then I had an autologous stem cell transplant and I'm currently on maintenance therapy. Mm -hmm. um, so a very, pretty much a typical path. Um, I've been in remission for about seven years now. So I haven't had to go back on treatment since um, the initial induction therapy, but I am so encouraged and um, excited by the advancement in treatment because I know that this is an incurable cancer that I'm living with and one day I might need more treatment. And to know that there are so many other options that can be thrown my way is encouraging because only seven years ago, I thought I had five years. I thought that was my prognosis. And so to be out seven years now, I can't tell you what that feels like as a patient. Um, so from a coping perspective, it is tough. It's tough to have a cancer diagnosis. I don't think I know anyone who would say otherwise and living with an incurable cancer, it takes an emotional toll. Um, and I yeah. think that's, you know, I mean, that's an, that's an understatement. Um, yeah. And it has changed my life. Wow, thank you, Tiffany. I, I can really sense your passion. One, one follow-up question for you. You know, when physicians like Dr. Blue and Dr. Smith say you've got multiple myeloma, We've got treatments. I wonder if you could just share what you would say to other patients who may be afraid of the road ahead, who may be uh, discomforted by potential uh, adverse events. What, what would you say as a mindset that they should have going into treatment? I think we all have to find our own inner peace with any type of diagnosis that it is that we receive. Um, we, my faith is a very important part of my journey. So I had to balance what I heard, what I believed and what was real, you know? And it's a balancing, it was a balancing act for me. It's one day, one, one area would take over and take control over the other. And another day I might find more, more, um, more peace in my faith. So I would say to people, um, you don't have to walk this journey alone. We tend to suffer in silence as Black people in general, unnecessarily, and we don't have to. Um, we need to find support systems. We have to rely on people who can be there and help us and support, because every day isn't going to be easy. So I would tell them to um, find that peace, f f f determine where it is they want to they want to take this path and journey. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Tiffany. Very well put. Hey, Bill, I want to just add 30, 10 seconds to that. One thing that I would tell people too, is in, if they get newly diagnosed with multiple myeloma, because it's so rare, it's okay to get what they call a second opinion and talk to somebody who's a multiple myeloma specialist, okay? So for example, most cancer doctors, they see breast cancer, then the next patient might be colon cancer, the next patient might be lung cancer. And then they see you as multiple myeloma, okay? And they all trying to treat it and figure it out. But me, the first person before you is myeloma, the person after you is multiple myeloma. Like, and, and so this is what I do, okay? And so it's okay if you newly diagnosed to say, you know what, let me all, you know, it's just to double check. Like, hey, this person really wanted me to be on this chemo. What you think? Is this right? And yeah. as long as you do that, it's a call a second opinion, it's fine. <laughs> Absolutely. Dr. Smith, um, what do we need to do in the community? That's where you, I think, um, and your, 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 your church in Chicago are actively involved. Can you give us some, 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 some critical things that we need to do in the community to continue to advance awareness and ultimately improve outcomes in the African-American community? Yeah, and, and let me, you know, I appreciate Dr. Blue's passion I, and Tiffany, her story is great, but let me give you a caution. Um, many, many, many more Black folk are dying every day from obesity, high blood pressure, other things. So when you go to your doc, the first thing that Tiffany said was your comfort zone. Here's where comfort is that we don't have. COVID has killed us because we got misinformation. So my point to you is that all of us need to ask ourselves, who do we trust beyond ourselves in the medical community? If you start with a competent physician, Dr. Blue, what he talked about, is not going to happen. 
You're not going to have resistance because most folk with kidney disease don't have multiple myeloma. Most folk with fatigue don't have multiple myeloma. So the caution is, don't be so focused on this. You need to go through the steps of a competent physician who will look at your case correctly. I'm a hematologist. I can, take a, I can take a CBC without doing a bone marrow and tell you where you are. That's my expertise. But you don't start with me. You start with a general physician. Most black people are dying because of lack of good, competent, general care. Now, having said that, Mother myeloma is not known in our community. We need to advocate for those patients. When, as Dr. Blue said, once you have a diagnosis, that's when you are adamant about getting the proper care. But when you've got anemia, or you've got kidney disease, or you're overweight, 90% of those patients are not going to have multiple myeloma. We miss it on the other end because we have mistrust in our community about health care. If you look at the disparities of health among us, 70% can be prevented from lifestyle changes. If we had better nutrition, if we worked out more in those things, we're gonna save millions of black lives. So I don't wanna dilute the passion of multiple myeloma, but what's killing us is violence and obesity and high blood pressure and these other things. Once you're diagnosed with a anemia or a blood source issue, Dr. Blue is right. Get the most expert person you can. But as a common black person every day, if we don't begin to take, take look at COVID, why has COVID killed so many black people? Ask that question. The, the disparity is because of mistrust with basic care in our community. We need better facilities in our community. We need better trained physicians. We need more folk that look like Dr. Blue and, I, and myself, that look like us, that people can trust. Because if you miss those things, what's gonna kill you are these common diseases among black people that are killing us at a tremendous rate every single day. So my caution is get good basic medical care. Once you're diagnosed, get the expert care. Talk, call Dr. Blue and say, hey, I may have my little, a mugger, I need, I need your help, but don't start there. Start with your basic care. That will save millions of black lives. Thank you. That is, that is a great caution, Dr. Smith. And, um, and thank you for bringing that up. Um, are, there, are, there, are there suggestions that you have to help enrich the conversation with providers uh, who might not look like you or Dr. Blue, because the reality is, as you mentioned, uh, th th there aren't as many African-American physicians as needed. And so are there, are, there, are there conversation points that you would both suggest patients have to make sure that they're getting competent, uh, uh, ethnic-centric yes. care? I, I think there, there are. You, you know, it starts again, Tiffany mentioned her faith. Let, let's face it, Black folk tend to focus on their faith and their religion. I think the church has to become much more active in the common, we can't just preach and teach the gospel. The real gospel is wholeness of life. So that churches need to understand what is my congregation's condition physically, mentally. In, in our church, there's a robust healthcare professionals, nurses, doctors, clinicians, who we have men's day and we say, what are your numbers? Tell me your PSA, what's your weight? What's your obesity index? What's your blood pressure? And so we do this on a sequential basis, why? We wanna get black folk healthier. Across the board, we are not healthy people, often to no fault of our own, but the issue is mortality and morbidity is high because we don't have a network, Tiffany talked about this, of confidence. Somebody can say, hey, you know, you're not looking right. Oh, yeah, I'm your buddy. Why are you tired on the golf course or whatever? What is your basic healthcare trust index? And so I think that places like churches and places of faith where Black folk have confidence in need to step up and do a better job in screening for things like diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, breast cancer, 
prostate cancer, colon cancer. Churches can do this because they have a trust factor that can be factored into getting the right kind of care. Thank you. Okay, hey, Bill, Bill, can I can I can I just add thirty seconds? Yeah. I just want I just want to yeah. add this. I, I'm a, I'm gonna say this too, Doctor Smith. I don't blame people sometimes for not trusting us. You know what I'm saying? Like as the doctors, as the medical community, unfortunately, man, we've let people down, especially people of color, especially black folks. You know, we have not done right. OK, so then like like and this would be very quick, but like if you look at, you know, certain companies that have really done wrong by certain people and now some of those certain companies might be coming out with a vaccine that's supposed to be helping them. And they really yeah. was trying to push black them. And blue, we need that. We need we need COVID. Let me just say this. Black people get vaccinated for COVID. If you, but you don't, you but you can't. But you, can't but, you, but you also can't fault people sometimes for not trusting the system like you know what i mean so i think what we need to do you know what i mean is kind of just say hey like i like and recognize that like you know what i mean and not say like oh just trust them because we said so but like but recognize say like look we get it you know what i mean but also we know this is something that's going to help you you understand what i mean because you dr blue you have a reputation in the black community i do as well so where black folk have been burned we, we cannot afford to let them stay there. In the last 30 days, 99% of people who died from COVID were unvaccinated. Yep. And too many were black people. Even though they've been burned, we, you and I have to say to them, get vaccinated unequivocally because we know that their fears are unfounded in this area. Yeah. You have a position of trust where we must break down ignorance. Yeah. Tuskegee was real. These things are real. But, but not, not even real. not even Tuskegee. We don't have to go that far back. Exactly. Tiffany, was, <laughs> Tiffany probably went to the emergency room point, saying that she had is, back pain. And some is, emergency room doctor probably said, oh, it's nothing. Oh, I'm not going to do well, anything. Well, you know what I mean? So this happens yeah. too common to too many of us. And now this she might have waited six months later to get the actual scan that she needed. You know well, what I mean? That's not my and experience. She, I, it I happens. Will tell you this. I will tell you this. Black, white, Hispanic, whatever. Nine percent of most physicians, that would not happen. We are too well trained today. It happens, but that's called anecdotal. Right. The majority of patients who have back pain are not going to be ignored. And so we have to be careful that we don't preach a scenario that does occur, but rare, when the majority of those people don't even get to the ER. What we need to do is make sure that our clinics in our neighborhood community health centers are much more accessible because today we are watching how people are being treated. But when we buy into the scenario that your doctor doesn't care or is incompetent, we have increased the risk of mortality. We've got to stop doing that. Absolutely. That's Listen, we're, can I say something? I'm yeah, going to go to Tiffany and then we're going to jump right to Q&A. We got a really active conversation. We're not going to solve all this today. Great dialogue, <laughs> Tiffany, and then we go to q and I just want to say that two things can be true at the same time, right? And I think geographically, I can say that in the South, I still see those disparities among providers, uh, not just even myself, even, even when I was still practicing before I retired, patients, you know, I see the disparities that they face among people who look like them and people who don't look like them because they, they, they are perceived as one way when they walk in and present, there's a bias already attached and a stigma attached. So yeah, I agree we don't have to go back as far as Tuskegee. Real day, real day, real time, disparities are existing. But I believe that both of these things can be true at the same time. And we have to we have a responsibility to help educate our community, but I, the onus is not 100% on us as patients and as Black people. The onus is also on the researchers who fly into our communities and want to get numbers and data on us. Um, the, the onus is on the institutions that have set up these DNI centers and say they're doing this and doing that, but what are they really doing? The onus is on providers you know, who are being given a very nice salary to take care of us and they aren't doing a great job taking care of us. So it's, it, it just, it goes it's both ways. It's, 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 it's a decades long problem. It, it is. And it's a multifactorial issue. I mm -hmm. think that's the, 
summary that all of you are trying to articulate. Uh, and I appreciate that. Let's quickly try to get some of these questions. The chat, you guys are, you guys have just ignited a fire in the audience, right? So really quickly, Dr. Smith and Blue, is there a link between prostate cancer and uh, multiple myeloma? Not that we're aware of, and the, and the problem is, is that there may be, um, but unfortunately of the how multiple myeloma gets started, we don't know, unfortunately. So we know like that people get it, but how they get it, what's it's connected to, unfortunately the data isn't just there and it's not mature, so we don't know as of yet. Okay, uh, I've been treated, I've, I've, I've had back pain for several years, and all my physician tells me to do is to take Motrin. <laughs> Some days I can't get out of bed, what should I do? You know, so uh, it's very strict criteria and guidelines for doctors to say like, all right, is this back pain a problem? Okay. And so if you're not getting the care that you need and you feel like, hey, this is happening over a long period of time, it's okay to, you know, unfortunately, sometimes the black people would be so loyal, you know, because that's just in us to be so loyal. But if the doctor not really helping you and you're not, and you screaming and saying, hey, something wrong. Ask somebody else and say, hey, hey, I'm gonna be honest with you. It's other communities. They, listen, listen, man, it's other communities that come in my office and they say, look, I need this. This is what's going on with me. I've researched this. I know this. This is what tests need to be run. But we come in and be like, I don't know, uh, you know, I, you know. But but so if you say, hey, something is wrong and you think it's really a problem, go ask somebody else and say, hey, I'm concerned. This is a problem. This other guy not hearing me. And, you know, and if that person don't hear him, go to somebody else. Absolutely. Okay. Go again, somewhere else. The follow up uh, again. Let's 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 again. We're we're too sophisticated for this. Listen very carefully. You go to somebody else. If they tell you the same thing, you must believe the doctors. You know, I have patients who do doctor shopping. They find somebody to, to give them what they want. If you if you have to do that, that means your doctor is incompetent. But if you go to two or three physicians and they tell you your back pain is the same, all three of them, that's what you have. You see, again, it, healthcare is a trust issue. And if you don't have competent people that you trust, you're gonna have bad outcomes all the time. Dr. Blue just talked about something very significant. We don't know the etiology of multiple myeloma. So what's gonna to have to happen? More dollars, more studies like he's doing, that black people will call experimental. Well, well, guess what? The reason that the, the death rate from lymphoma and leukemia have dropped over the last 50 years is because of experimentation. Clinical studies are critical. When the COVID vaccines were in that developmental stage, I called the university and said to them, how many black folk are in your study? They said less than 1%. I went to the churches in Chicago, they can tell you this, and got hundreds of black folk to sign up. Why? You don't want studies done that exclude black people and develop a therapy that when it comes out, guess what? Won't work in black people. So our paranoia is not going to protect us. We need competent physicians today. And so I push our people to participate in the vaccine studies. That's why we can say today that these vaccines work in black people. Well, listen, with that, with, with that note, Tiffany, I'm gonna give you the final word and then we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to close this down. But Tiffany, the final word we'll before we leave the audience with some action steps. Yeah, so I, I think this this demands a part two, but yeah. I, Dr. Dr. Smith, I'm struggling as a patient because I hear you and I agree with you, but it's not black and white. Of course it I isn't. Have, I, have a, a, I have a situation that I've been dealing with since my, since my stem cell transplant that I have gone to four providers and I've been in care. I've not been shopping. We've been referring and going and I've been not getting answers. Yesterday, I saw my fourth specialist who actually specializes in the symptoms that I'm experiencing and I finally got answers. Good. Well, it wasn't a trust issue. It was in, in, my, in, in my soul, I knew something, what I was hearing wasn't right. It wasn't that I didn't trust them. It wasn't that, it, it, it was that they weren't giving me the answers. So I needed to go to a fourth. 
and I you might have needed to go to you a know, fit. You know that you are not the typical black patient, and you have access to things that most black folk are not going to get to the fourth. You know that. I'm but also, Dr. Smith, you got to know your body. You've what? been living in your body for 60 years. Church, you can't, I know but you can't. Better than you do. No, guys, no, that's on, not true. Out, you can't out, tell me that some doctor is going to tell out, you what's out. wrong and what's right. You know what I mean? Right. And unfortunately, especially in the South, man, we having problems out here. Our people, is, our people are hurting and they're not really being heard. And that's the problem. And that's listen, the problem. Listen, then y'all need to get some love, more than love. this to be your doctor. <laughs> right, exactly. Listen, listen, listen. Let, me, let me try to, let me try to put a bow on this. this. So so one thing that is clear, we need a session two, three, four, yes. and we need some PhD level courses here, right? So, so, so a couple of things, right? First and foremost, I want to thank Dr. Tiffany Williams. I want to thank yes. Dr. Forrest Smith. And I want to thank Dr. Brandon Blue. Yes. If you didn't sense this passion, you're missing something in your in your heart and in your head. Secondly, I want to thank my company, Jansen and Johnson and Johnson, for sponsoring this. Yes. And while I can't make the commitment, I am sure the team is going to want to have conversations like this again and again. I want to thank Cap Alpha Psi Fraternity, my fraternity, and I want to thank Johnson and Johnson again. Johnson and Johnson has committed that we are gonna spend $100 million over the next several years to try to help close this gap. Our company should be a part of this solution. Yes. And we're gonna step up and hopefully make a difference in this space. So for those of you on the chat line, this presentation will be available, I believe for 45 days. So if you wanna look at it again, please do so. And uh, we would advise you to go to the Jansen booth where you can learn much more about multiple myeloma, multiple myeloma and current treatments. And thank you all for your active participation. Once again, a big round of applause for Tiffany, Dr. Horace Smith, and Dr. Brandon Blue. Thank you very much. You're working hard, man. You're young. I'm <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you all. All right. Thanks, everybody. Great. great. Take care.